Computer Magazine, innovative technology for computing professionals. In this interview conducted by science and technology writer Greg Goff, Mark Dean, a participant in the original IBM PC design team, looks back 30 years to review the events that led to the design of a very un-IBM computer, a small device that used hardware and software from outside vendors and made the logic and BIOS code available to anyone. Why the choice of the Intel over the, the, the IBM chip? And I guess there was, was there some talk about using the 801 in there? Or, or you know, how did that evolve, the Intel, <laughs> Intel into <laughs> IBM instead of IBM into IBM? Um, interesting question. Um, you have to remember, at the time, CMOS was kind of a new thing. Yeah. I mean, it really hadn't been... The notion of a CMOS-based, quote, microprocessor was a fairly new idea. Yeah. Uh, if you remember, the mainframes at the time were still bipolar. Okay, yeah. And so we were pretty much good at doing bipolar. Uh, we had just started building um, processors um, that were kind of 801-ish, you know, risk space. But that was kind of a new concept as well. I mean, it wasn't completely figured out. So we, there wasn't a processor sitting on, on the shelf from IBM that you could put into a box smaller than a refrigerator. But we wanted to build something smaller than a refrigerator. Okay. And so we had to look beyond what we had in our pockets. And we knew we needed to use something that was uh, that we could power by plugging it into a wall socket, right? Not 220. So, so there, there are some constraints, you know. Those constraints drive you. And like I said, we had done Data Master and Display Writer, which were predecessors, were built off of off-the-shelf Intel processors. Mm-hmm. So we had used Intel processors, but we actually uh, evaluated and did prototypes of Motorola processors as well. In fact, there was a there was a group of us that thought the uh, Motorola processors might be a better way to go. And actually, we built, I had built a prototype of uh, 6809, which was one of the competitors mm-hmm. of the 8088, and we thought that would lead into the 6800 family which uh, we, we thought that's what Apple had ended up using yeah. on theirs. Uh, we went the Intel route. It was just it was a matter of choice, probably a matter of what we were comfortable with. It turns out the graphics card, the card I did, mm-hmm. was Motorola-based. Oh, was. really? So we were the first to blend Motorola-based chips with Intel-based chips in the same system. Wow, now, was that hard to get the program that bridge? Or? Uh, it wasn't that hard. Okay. I mean, it was, like I said, the, we could we figured it out. It was pretty straightforward for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure, I know that uh, we had gotten feedback from both Motorola and Intel that it couldn't be done, that it was hard. Why would you ever do that? Why wouldn't you just use the chips that we designed to work with each other? And we thought that we were going to use the best of what each had to offer. And we thought the Motorola graphics chips worked well. We thought Intel processors would work well enough for us because we uh, used them. And we thought the 8-bit 8088 was all we really needed in the first design. I was going to ask you, why the 8088 instead of the 8086? We thought that's all we really needed. That was plenty. Um, And, in fact, you know, back then that was a big deal. If you could get 64 kilobytes of memory. Ooh, that was a lot. I mean, that's all you'd ever need. Plus, a processor running at, what was at the time, what, one megahertz? I believe it was. It was really kind of slow. Mm -hmm. We thought, how is anybody ever going to use all this processing power? And we thought, okay, that's that's enough. Um, And we had to make those kind of choices if we were going to build something in 12 to 13 months. I mean, you have to make those kind of choices. And so that's what what drove us. I would say IBM had much stronger technology, but I couldn't take five years to do it. I'm going to say, you couldn't book it as you can say, I need a chip. I need a chip and it'd be to come and be ready in five years. 
That was you, that was the development cycles, and there wasn't anything off the shelf. So you had to pick either Motorola, Intel, and there was Zilog. Those were the three choices. The 6502. Remember that chip as well. Okay. And we had built prototypes. Somebody had built a prototype of, from each one of those. And uh, we closed on the one we thought would get us there or something. I think you expand a little bit on just some of the programming tricks you did there with between the Motorola and the Intel, because most of my readers, of course, are very technical people, and they, okay. they, you know, anything in particular that you remember doing, or... It is getting pretty technical. The clocking schemes, obviously, were different Yeah, on both, and so you had to adapt the clocking schemes such that they would sync up and they could communicate, because the real issue, since they were two separate subsystems, you just had to try to figure a way to get them to communicate. Yeah. You had to adapt the processor requesting uh, signaling to the I.O. signaling that was on, like, the graphics controller. Yep. And you could take some synchronization best practices, you know, just ways of synchronizing communications, and make that work. So, really, once you knew the clocking uh, and signaling from the processor, and you knew how the I.O. devices wanted to respond to, to talk to the outside world. Okay. You had to have a, a set of interface in between that would just do the translation. And it was just a matter of translation. Okay. So, and in fact, you had to do that for more than just Intel to Motorola chips. Right? There were, because we had the floppy interface mm -hmm. was another one, which was done by a different vendor. Okay. Uh, we had the interfaces to the printer and the um, cassette, <laughs> if, you, if you remember, that we sold the original PC without a floppy, and you could buy cassette decks. That's right. I remember that. That's how you would store data, is on a cassette. So we sold a few of those. Actually, people actually use those. And so uh, we had to build that interface yeah. out of something else. And so all these interfaces were not necessarily designed to work together, and so we built the bus that translated most of this was the became the ISOBUS. I mean, yeah, that, that's what yeah. that was the point of translation, and that was the standard. And everybody has to work off that standard. I mean, that's how it worked out. Yeah. And so built to this, and it will work. And once you knew that, you just made it work. You think the fact that it, that it worked so well was the fact that you, you did bring in so much from outside, and everybody knew that, that well, this, this is the sandbox. Uh, choice here now we need to I think it gave us what we needed to be successful which was the inclusion of the rest of the world yeah I, I truly believe despite whether we did it on purpose or not which is another discussion because <laughs> <laughs> you could have said we we accidentally did some of these things which is fair um, but the bottom line is the reason we were successful is the PC was inclusive it enabled other people to participate in the industry. Mm -hmm. right? we, we essentially sold a platform that was the base for everyone else to jump in. Yeah. And no one else had built something that allowed everybody else to play. The, the fact that we gave away logics and the bio software in the technical reference manual, written down, all the, all the programmable logic, everything was in that book. So you could buy all the exact same parts, program them the exact same way, and build the exact same thing, as long as you wanted to, and that's what a lot of people did. And that allowed people not only to build IBM-compatible machines, but also have enough detail to build adapters and other devices that would plug into the IBM machines. And it made it work. For other great articles, interviews, and more from the computer, visit the IEEE Computer Society website at computer.org computer.